Hello there, my fellow Imperial Assassins, and welcome to your weekly dose of the Primarch's lore. This time it is part 5 from my coverage of Horus Lupercal. Today's approach to the overall topic of Horus is gonna be a bit different from my usual Primarch videos. That is because the events we're gonna discuss today don't really have Horus as a main character, yet nevertheless they are all about him, if that makes sense. The story I'm talking about is the infamous assassination attempt on the War Master, under orders from Malkador the Sigilite. There have been, of course, many other attempts apart from this one, but as you're gonna find out, this is more of a special case. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? So, like I said in the previous episode about the Istvan Free atrocity, I'm not gonna go into details about the drop site massacre on Istvan 5. Long story short, Horus and the other free traitor Primarchs basically built a lot of fortifications on the dead moon of Istvan 5. Then they pretty much went, come at me bro, with the other loyalists. Three legions were dispatched in the form of the Raven Guard, Salamanders and the Iron Hands to teach them a lesson. Even more legions in the form of the Night Lords, the Iron Warriors, the Word Bearers and the Alpha Legion were supposed to be the second wave of loyalists to completely obliterate the traitors. However, the second wave were all traitors by that point, and the first three legions were completely decimated. You already know the fates of those three Primarchs, as I already had three miniseries on them. But since I don't want to gloss over the events entirely, I will mention a pretty lengthy quote that can serve as sort of an aftermath to Istvan V. And here we go. After the killing had stopped, and the dead were gathered into great funeral pyres across the broken desert of the Urgal Depression, the once grey skies of the planet burned orange with the reflected glow of a thousand pyres. Thousands of Astartes loyal to Horus gathered around a great reviewing stand. As the sun began to sink beyond the horizon, the smooth black plains of the stand shone with a blood-red glow. The stand was erected as a series of cylinders of ever-decreasing diameter, one standing atop the other. The base was perhaps a thousand meters in width, constructed as a great grandstand upon which the sons of Horus stood, their preeminent position as the elite of the War Master in no doubt after this great victory. Atop this pedestal of flame was another platform, occupied by the senior officers of the 16th Legion. Above the senior officers of the Sons of Horus stood the traitor Primarchs. Seven beings of monumental power stood on the penultimate tier of the reviewing stand, their armor still stained with the blood of their foes. Finally, the uppermost tier of the reviewing stand was a tall cylinder of crimson that stood a hundred meters above even the other Primarchs. None other than Horus stood atop of that his clawed hands raised in salute. A third cloak of some great creature hung from his shoulders, and the light of the corpse pyres reflected from the amber eye upon his breastplate. As the sun finally dipped below the horizon, a flight of assault craft roared over the Urgal Hills, their wings dipping in salute to the mighty warrior below. No sooner had the aircraft passed overhead than the massed Astartes began to march around the reviewing stand, their arms snapping out and hammering their breastplates in salute of the War Master. At some unseen signal, a flame ignited on the northern slopes of the Urgal Depression, and a blazing line of phosphor leapt across the ground in a snaking arc that described the outline of an enormous blazing eye upon the hillside. Super heavy tanks fired in salute of Horus, and the towering immensity of the titan Dies Irae inclined its massive head in a gesture of respect. The ashes of the dead fell like confetti over Horus's mighty arms, as thousands of traitor space marines cheered, their cries of, Hail Horus! Hail Horus! echoing long into the darkness. 
After learning of Horus' perfidy on Istvan III, the sires and cyruses of various secret imperial assassin clades were charged by Malkador the Sigilite, the secret master of assassins, with the daunting task of slaying the arch traitor. But every assassination attempt against the war master had failed thus far. The assassins had thrown the most gifted students into the meat grinder, sending them in blind and half prepared. Every strike against the War Master was broken, and he had shrugged off each attempt without even noticing it. Every time the Clade Masters met, they were forced to grimly listen to a catalogue of just each other's failures. After the last failed attempt by Clade Venenum, a new strategy was decided upon. With the advice of special guest star Constantin Valdor, the masters of the clades realized that their mission were not simply flawed, but they were not enough. No single assassin, no matter how well trained, no matter which clade he hailed from, could ever hope to terminate the arch douchebag by himself. But a collective of assassins, a strike team consisting of an elite unit of killers, handpicked just for this task, might be enough to succeed. There had never been a precedent for such an initiative for the Emperor would have never sanctioned assassination as an official Imperial policy. In the past, the Clades had fielded two or three of their operatives on a single mission when the circumstances were the most extreme, but these assassins were always from the same Clade, and even this occurred only after much deliberation. Yet, in this crucial and extreme instance, Malkador authorized the creation of the very first Imperial Execution Force. Horus did not adhere to the rules of war, nor did he balk at the use of a tactic because it offended someone's sensibility. At Istvan III he had bombed his sword brethren, his own warriors even, into oblivion. Nothing, no matter how vile, was beyond him. It was decided by the assassins that if they were to kill this enemy, they couldn't limit themselves to the moral abstracts which had guided the clades in the past. They had to dare to exceed them. Six assassins, one from each clade, were gathered together and given the task of killing Horus by any means necessary. In the meantime, the Dark Apostle Erebus had decided on a bold course of action on his own. He firmly believed that as long as the traitor legions followed Horus, all would be right with the world. However, Erebus had come to realize a truism of warfare. If assassins could be used against Horus, then they could also be used by the traitors against the Emperor. Within Imperial history, only one of the so-called Black Pariahs had ever existed. He was a former Imperial assassin by the codename Spear. Born as a human untouchable, he was captured by the Silent Sisters and brought to Terra, where the assassin clade Calexus tried to give him an upgrade. Now, if you don't know what an untouchable is, please watch my video on the Sisters of Silence I uploaded yesterday. It is not known whether these augmentations or his unnatural abilities made him into a black pariah. Spear was eventually deemed too unstable and even dangerous by the Clade's masters to be left alive. He was placed in the care of the Sisters of Silence and was sent aboard one of their vessels bound for the heart of a nearby sun. Unfortunately, this vessel was intercepted by a traitor vessel carrying none other than the asshole Erebus. Sensing the usefulness of this specimen, Erebus found a new purpose for the captive. He forced Spear to undergo a painful and vile chaotic ritual, in which a minor demon from the Immaterium was bonded with the formal Imperial Assassin. This bonding created a highly dangerous apex predator, a so-called counter -psyker, capable of redirecting a psyker's power directly back upon him. I don't have to tell you how useful such a guy could be, given that the Emperor was the strongest psyker in the Imperium. In order to utilize this ability, the Black Pariah first had to obtain a sample of the target's blood. Some two years later, after the events of the Dropsite Massacre, Erebus tasked his deadly minion to assassinate the Emperor. Spear spent a great deal of time, but was ultimately able to acquire information about a document which possessed a minute drop of the Emperor's blood. 
This document was to be found on the world of Dagonet, which would bring him into conflict with the Imperial Execution Force later on. As the Horus heresy progressed, and the word filtered through the galaxy of Horus's galactic uprising, many worlds began to erupt into anarchy. As the populations began to split whether they should remain loyal to the Emperor or join the War Master. Dagonet was one such world, where Horus Luperkel was second only to the Emperor in being celebrated by the people. The world's nobility had declared in favor of Horus and rejected the rule of Terra. The common people, on the other hand, were the ones fighting back in the name of the Emperor. The Assassin Execution Force soon learned of the future whereabouts of where Horus would be. Agents of the Imperium operating covertly in the Tabian Sector reported a strong likelihood that Horus was planning to visit Dagonet along his flagship the Vengeful Spirit, in order to show his strength to his supporters. The Clades also believed that the War Master's forces would use Dagonet as a foothold, from which to secure the allegiance of every planet in the Tabian sector. The assassins successfully circumvented all detection and were able to secretly arrive on Dagonet. They gathered intelligence to determine what exactly was occurring. In the first moments of the insurrection, desperate signals had been sent to the Space Marine Legions and their fleet assets. But these had all gone unanswered. Both the starships of the Admiralty and of the Legions had battles of their own to fight, and they were far away from the Tabian stars. They could not intervene. Across the planet, the forces that carried Horus's banner were only days away from breaking the back of the Resistance. The turncoat nobility on the planet didn't need to see Horus to adhere to his banner. His influence hung over Dagonet like an eclipse blotting out the sun. While gathering intelligence and deciding upon the best course of action, two of the Execution Force's members decided to set about on a different course of action. The Venenum assassin Jenniker Solom had become distracted by her mission with the plight of the local loyalist Dagonetti, who continued to wage a rebellion despite their desperate situation. The Dagonetti introduced this woman to the forbidden writings of the Lectitio Divinitatis, which postulated the worship of the Emperor as the one true god of humanity. Her interest in helping the people of Dagonet and her newfound spirituality created friction with the rest of the task force. Thus, she took her leave, and the mission to assassinate Horus continued on without her. The Culexus assassin Iota, showing great interest in Solemn's quest, followed her after that. This pair of assassins would soon come into conflict with the Black Pariah Spear. Unfortunately, the agent of Erebus was much too powerful and he killed them both. In the meantime, the rest of the execution force also found out about Spear and realized he might be just as important a target as Horus himself. The Sons of Horus Legion finally arrived in system on Dagonet. The vengeful spirit settled in orbit above the world. The vessel had brought a military force of such deadly intent and utter lethality that the planet and its people had never known the like in all their recorded history. This was the visitation granted to Dagonet by the Sons of Horus, the tip of a sword blade forged in shock and awe. Far below, on the planet's surface, across the white marble of Liberation Plaza, a respectful hush fell over the throng of people gathered there. At this time, the execution force was in place. The Vindicari assassin Kel waited at the perfect assassin perch, ready for the arrival of the War Master. Traitor Governor Nigron was there among them, waiting with every other Dagonetti for the storm that was about to break. Suddenly, there was a blast of fanfare from the trumpets of a military band, and the governor stepped forward. When he spoke, a vox bead at his throat amplified his voice. Glory to the Liberator, he cried. Glory to the War Master. Glory to Horus. Then the sons of Horus teleported onto the planet's surface. The tallest of the warriors, his battle gear decked with more finery than any others, stepped forward. He was covered with honor chains and combat laurels, and about his shoulders he wore a metal dolman made from ores mined in the depths of Cathonia. The mantle of the War Master, 
forged by Horus's captains as a symbol of his might and unbreakable will. He drew a gold-chased bolt pistol, raising it high above his head. Then he fired one shot into the air. Glory to Horus. The warrior then holstered his gun and unsealed his helmet, drawing it up so the world might see his face. This was to be the moment of truth. The Vindicari assassin placed his crosshairs in the center of the scowling grill of the Warmaster's helmet. There was no hesitation and no margin for error. The assassin fired his Exodus rifle. The shot struck the target in the throat, reducing the flesh to atoms, superheating the fluid into steam, boiling the skin and vaporizing bone. The only sound was the fall of a headless corpse as it crashed into the ground. Horus was dead. Or was he? The assassins of the execution force had been duped. Horus had sent a surrogate, a sacrificial proxy. The Vindicare, in actuality, had killed Luke Sedere, the captain of the Sons of Horus, 13th Company. In their anger, the Sons of Horus turned upon the population and slaughtered all of them. Among the chaos and anarchy of the massacre of the entire population of Dagonet, the assassin Kell finally tracked Spear down, and with the assistance of the other fellow assassins, managed to finally draw him out and destroy him. Kell found himself to be the only survivor of the entire unit. The Vindicari assassin departed Dagonet and decided to make one last attempt on the Warmaster's life. Kell set his own ship on a direct course for the Vengeful Spirit's command bridge where he would seem to meet his fate when he ejected himself into space once he reached the intended target. This was to be an ultimately vain attempt to land a desperate shot at Horus, while the War Master stood looking out of the Battle Barge's observation deck into space. To all intents and purposes, the assassination mission had failed, but in reality, one could argue, they saved the Emperor's life. So maybe, in the end, it all balanced out. In the aftermath of the events of Dagonet, Horus would confront Erebus within his private chamber. He chastised the Dark Apostle for his audacious plan of assassinating the Emperor, declaring that when that moment finally dawned, it would be him, and him alone, who would kill the Master of Humanity. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the story of the assassins sent against Horus. Of course, this story is a lot richer and more complex than I described today, but there is a novel about it called Nemesis, which I will recommend at the end of the Horus miniseries. What are your thoughts on this assassination attempt? Do you think it could have worked better in another way? How would you assassinate Horus? I welcome even the silliest of plans in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor Protects.